Hello and welcome to the second uh, short lecture in the series of lectures about the philosophy of Søren Kierkegaard associated with the uh, course that I am teaching at the Ramakrishna Mission at Vivekananda University in Kolkata. Um, as I mentioned in the previous video, uh, these uh, uh, presentations are to supplement what goes on in the class, which is uh, being taught in a seminar fashion, uh, with additional uh, materials uh, being presented and discussed uh, there. And so uh, if you're not part of the class, you may find uh, that uh, some important uh, ideas are uh, approached uh, with too much uh, uh, quickness uh, or even superficiality. Now, uh, today uh, we'll be talking about two texts of Kierkegaard's. Uh, one is uh, uh, from the papers of one still living, and the other is the concept of irony. Uh, so we'll begin with uh, the one called uh, From the Papers of One Still Living. And uh, uh, it is a uh, a piece that uh, was published uh, originally in a periodical uh, as a kind of a serial. Uh, and uh, as uh, uh, you can see there, it uh, ostensibly is a review of a, a novel or a, a tale, I guess, uh, written by uh, Hans Christian Andersen. Uh, called Only a Fiddler. Uh, and the uh, uh, basic idea that Anderson uh, presents uh, is that uh, the uh, artistic creativity and even genius uh, of the uh, fiddler was thwarted because of uh, social uh, or public circumstances. And uh, Kierkegaard is uh, uh, critical uh, of that idea. He also uh, is critical uh, of Anderson for lacking any kind of uh, large overview, uh, what in Danish is called uh, leafs and schools, uh, means life view. Uh, and uh, according to uh, Kierkegaard, Anderson uh, lacks that, or as it's put here, completely lacks any philosophy of life. So it's pretty devastating. Uh, criticism of Anderson, uh, although uh, it's not clear uh, how widely read uh, the text was. Um, uh, and it's uh, interesting uh, that uh, Kierkegaard uh, designates the title uh, as from the papers uh, of one still living uh, published against uh, his will. And uh, so uh, this, I believe, is an indication of Kierkegaard's uh, complex relationship uh, with the public and uh, with the idea of being an author. Uh, so uh, here's a piece, uh, as I say, ostensibly of uh, literary criticism. Uh, it's uh, about a minor work by, uh, you know, his contemporaries, his contemporary Hans Christian Andersen, uh, who uh, uh, is, uh, is, was then and still is uh, among the most beloved Danish authors. Uh, and uh, he's saying that, well, uh, this was published against my will. So one has to ask, of course, you know, what is it uh, that uh, impelled it? Was the uh, text sort of purloined? Uh, from you and put out, really uh, without your foreknowledge, uh, or was uh, uh, there some other kind of compulsion which you didn't really uh, acknowledge as being your own desire to put this work out? Um, here's a quote from uh, Anderson which gives you a sense of what he believes, even though Kierkegaard uh, says he completely lacks any philosophy of life. Uh, well, Anderson had a philosophy of life, but I think it's 
uh, correct to say that uh, Kierkegaard uh, found uh, much to criticize about it. This very famous citation from uh, Anderson that I put up top there, uh, just living is not enough, one must have sunshine, freedom, and a little flower, uh, suggests uh, the kind of uh, uh, what Kierkegaard thought of as kind of uh, uh, nostalgic and uh, sentimental uh, kind of romanticism that he uh, uh, was objecting to uh, in this uh, in this review. Uh, it hurt Anderson, uh, we're told, uh, the review did, uh, uh, and uh, he felt that uh, Kierkegaard was his enemy. Uh, uh, sometime later, I think, when the second edition of Either Roar was published, uh, uh, Kierkegaard uh, sent a copy to Anderson, who interpreted it as an overture of friendship, and he appreciated it. Now, to talk about this text, what I would like to do uh, is uh, uh, read uh, uh, portions of a paper that I've written, uh, and uh, it's the most concise way, I think, to get out the main points that I want to get out, and then in class uh, we can uh, debate it. Uh, so, I'll just begin uh, reading now with a few uh, interlinear comments as I go along. Uh, Kierkegaard's theory of indirect communication is of utmost importance because the authorship itself is an example of it. Kierkegaard holds that communication of knowledge, uh, like in science, I guess, is direct communication. This is because knowledge depends upon the acquisition of objects of thought which can be straightforwardly transmitted from one to another, who can appropriate them by means of the medium of imagination. Uh, in other words, one uh, kind of takes what is given and uh, puts it into one's own uh, frame of reference uh, and uh, in that way uh, achieves a kind of understanding. However, uh, genuine human engagement, Kierkegaard argues, uh, can uh, never be transmitted directly from one to another. Hence, indirect communication must be used. In indirect communication, uh, the listener, or really in the case of Kierkegaard's uh, authorship here, his reader, is confronted by more than one possibility through his own decisive choice, uh, he thus becomes genuinely engaged. So the text from the papers of One Still Living presents the first adumbration of that theory. One Still Living is a peculiar pseudonym, uh, which apparently has no special significance for the work itself. Uh, it expresses Kierkegaard's stunned reaction to his father's death, uh, uh, in 1838, an event which both uh, greatly saddened him and at the same time uh, freed him to commence his authorship. Beyond that, the role played by Kierkegaard's father in his life uh, need not be of concern. Uh, the point is that he chose to write pseudonymously, however, without any attempt to conceal his identity, and that the designation suggests an active and involved role in the affairs of daily life, although that one is still living or involved, uh, hence at the ultimate insignificance of such affairs. Uh, the Christian is seen as the one who is dying. Kierkegaard's belief in the ultimate insignificance of worldly activity is immediately made ironically clear uh, in his announcement that the reflections are given against his will, uh, given to the public only against his will. He would rather devote his energies to another level, uh, but the demand of the public impinges. Thus, at first glance, the public is seen in the form of a demand, if not on the individual as such, then at least on the individual author, a demand which represents a standpoint 
of ultimate insignificance, but which is nonetheless an authentic demand, which cannot be, as it were, simply brushed aside. The public presents itself as an unavoidable demand for a response, which for Kierkegaard was always polemic. Okay, so in other words, one cannot sort of withdraw. One is bound uh, to engage with the public, uh, but this is not, in Kierkegaard's thinking about it, uh, what is the source of worthwhile activity. Uh, it's something in a way that, that is uh, a struggle to be uh, overcome in order to uh, pursue more significant uh, activities. The public presents itself as an unavoidable demand for a response, which for Kierkegaard is always polemic. It's never uh, cooperative in an ordinary, straightforward sense. It's always uh, setting up a kind of strong voice of opposition or a strong voice of criticism to engage in the public uh, activity or in the public sphere. Uh, Kierkegaard seems to uh, think uh, requires that one uh, uh, sort of assert oneself against the norms and uh, uh, prevailing values and customs uh, in the public. Kierkegaard's use of polemic, since it is inseparable from his notion for understanding his authorship philosophically from any perspective. When viewed in accord with the dynamics of the individual public relationship, it becomes indispensable because existence, which for Kierkegaard means existence as an individual, is dialectical. And the dialectic of existence always implies the polemical standpoint. But since a dialectical movement is at the heart of this work, its use must be examined in order to determine its function in relation to the emerging categories of the individual, which I prefer to call the existing individual. In Kierkegaard's own uh, wording, he simply says uh, the individual, but uh, that's a term that's easily misunderstood and to underscore the heart of uh, Kierkegaard's sense of what it means to be an individual. I prefer to say existing individual. Uh, so the relationship of the existing individual then to the world uh, in the form of the public. Uh, so on the title page, uh, uh, we, uh, uh, already have the idea uh, that uh, there is this polemical uh, and uh, forced uh, uh, intervention into uh, the works and life and uh, belief system that uh, prevail in the public sphere. So in this piece from the papers of One Still Living, as in all Kierkegaard's works, the polemic is quite naturally bound to the topic under discussion. Thus, the polemic here moves on the level of literary aesthetics, presenting Kierkegaard's understanding of what should be expected of a poet who has chosen to deal with epic themes. Briefly summarized, Kierkegaard in this work charges that Anderson is possessed by a form of self-pity and that it is nothing more or less than self-pity which stands as the only possible substantiation for the quote-unquote moral of the novel, uh, that is, that an unhappy environment can transform a genius into a miserable wretch. So, so this kind of sentiment, you know, poor fiddler, uh, his genius cannot be realized because he's not uh, encouraged or appreciated or supported by his uh, peers or by his environment. Uh, that 
idea uh, is the uh, target of, of Kierkegaard's polemic. He calls it a cowardly belief, uh, which uh, he asserts can only be explained by the false vanity of the author. And so with this remark, Kierkegaard's polemic is at once ad hominem, that is, it's against Anderson, the author, and not simply against the content of the uh, story. The argument becomes ad hominem as well as directed critically to the text itself. It is no wonder uh, that Anderson's reprisals should also be leveled in the form of caricature of the man, Sir Kierkegaard. Uh, Kierkegaard's rejoinder, uh, which charges that Anderson in putting uh, individual sentences from the papers of one still living into the mouth of an imaginary Hegelian was misappropriating the text and destroying its meaning uh, while terribly eliminating as Kierkegaard's own commentary on his own work uh, nevertheless uh, misses Anderson's point. Later on, uh, Kierkegaard uh, laments that uh, he was writing uh, in the uh, voice of a Hegelian or using a kind of Hegelian dialectic. Uh, so uh, Kierkegaard's relationship to Hegel uh, and to uh, the associated uh, philosophical systems which uh, uh, were derived from Hegel, including uh, significantly uh, the prevailing theological uh, 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 positions in Denmark, uh, uh, he uh, is both part of it and uh, opposed to it, and uh, this kind of uh, development of a stronger and stronger anti-Hegelian outlook uh, is uh, uh, something that uh, uh, is uh, uh, parallel to the development uh, and, and I think uh, inseparable uh, from the development of this idea of the existing individual. Uh, perhaps we should call Kierkegaard a counter-Hegelian in order to indicate this kind of uh, two-phase uh, relationship uh, that he has with Hegel. He both uses Hegelian dialectic uh, and uh, tries to refute the Hegelian system. Uh, Anderson was attacking Kierkegaard as he himself had been attacked by Kierkegaard. So as we consider the painful personal conflicts which dissipated much of Kierkegaard's philosophically creative energies throughout his life, uh, we must remember that in all cases, Kierkegaard consciously brought these conflicts upon himself. His polemical stance, of course, led to conflict. The conflict often became bitterly personal, and Kierkegaard's uh, feelings uh, were, of course, uh, challenged, uh, and uh, he, uh, you know, was, uh, uh, I guess, uh, uh, hurt, or, or at least, uh, uh, you know, sort of taken aback uh, by some of these reactions, and uh, this further uh, fortified his idea of the uh, va value and status of polemical uh, writing. Uh, it was something that was necessary, but it created a kind of uh, uh, lack of appreciation for the polemicist within the public realm. Uh, and that, you know, very sort of straightforward reading of what happens when somebody feels rejected, uh, Kierkegaard takes us into uh, a very uh, profound level of understanding issues uh, such as alienation uh, and uh, uh, inward uh, uh, feeling. The reason for these conflicts, the reason for the kinds of conflicts that say the uh, quarrel between Anderson and Kierkegaard represents, 
uh, these conflicts, which at first glance must appear paltry, is on the contrary one of the cornerstones of the individual's dialectical relation with the public. And has been suggested about Kierkegaard's indirect method, that which is most significant, that is, I mean philosophically significant, is left fundamentally unsaid. And what is said should be read insofar as it points to that which is not. All right, so uh, this is a trick in reading Kierkegaard often, is that what he's saying uh, is skirting around uh, the issue that uh, he really wants uh, uh, to bring out. His uh, attitude is that his reader, as he calls him, uh, can uh, uh, appreciate what is unsaid and recognize the direction in which uh, the uh, uh, uttered or written uh, discourse is pointing. Two additional points should be mentioned briefly with regard to this short work, in that they will elucidate to some extent the nature of Kierkegaard's apparently personal attack on Anderson. The first is that Kierkegaard regarded it the task of an epic work to present its theme in a living organic unity, one that exhibits some connection with the poet's own point of view. Philosophy, no less literature, uh, is not something which, uh, you know, sort of is produced and stands aside uh, the creator, the philosopher or the artist, or in fact any individual. Their work and the expression uh, that it contains should have an organic and unbreakable uh, connection uh, with the subjective uh, outlook of the uh, individual who creates it. You know, this, of course, is uh, why that stinging notion uh, that uh, Kierkegaard asserts uh, that Anderson completely lacks any philosophy of life uh, is uh, uh, so important for him. In order to be able to do this, that is, in order to uh, present the theme as a living organic unity which exhibits some connection with the poet's own view of life, in order to do this, the poet himself obviously must have a thought through life view. That's translation of this Danish term, which uh, is, I think, uh, unusual, uh, leaf sandsquel, so but literally translated, it means life view. And this precisely is what Kierkegaard claims that Anderson lacks. Of course, his criticism could not fairly claim that Anderson stood alone among epic poets in lacking a thought through life view, a fact which makes the personal nature of Kierkegaard's critical attack perhaps all the more puzzling. And this raises a second point which remains to be made. In criticizing Anderson, that is in criticizing Anderson as an epic poet, Kierkegaard saw as his function uh, to be as a maiotic interlocutor. That means to be like Socrates. He's the Socratic critic of Anderson, trying to get Anderson to kind of uh, give birth to uh, this life's view, which is apparently, according to Kierkegaard, fully lacking from this story. So Kierkegaard in his polemic is like the Socratic gadfly who would bring Anderson to the properly thought out life view. And Kierkegaard says at the very end of the work that although he would rather have whispered what he has written into Anderson's ear, he hopes it is nevertheless clear that it is written, as he puts it, with sympathetic ink. And this, I guess, is a way also that Kierkegaard interprets Socrates. Socrates uh, uh, appears, you know, when one sees him uh, in action uh, to be harsh and critical and sort of breaking down somebody. But Socrates 
own claim was that it was for the sake of allowing the person to deliver that idea which uh, was within them. And the fact that Socrates says he fails does not mean, according to Socrates, that he fails because there was not something within, but because his methodology, the philosophical word here is myutics, his methodology uh, failed. And so Kierkegaard is saying, I hope you don't misunderstand what I'm doing. I'm trying to be a Socratic midwife in the guise of gadfly here. That's what he means by saying, I hope Anderson understands this, that this was written with sympathetic ink. Inc. Socrates performed in the public place, Kierkegaard is performing in the public place. Uh, that has consequences uh, which uh, distract from the purpose of what's being done, uh, so Kierkegaard says. Thus, uh, Kierkegaard's personal attacks, uh, we can say, at least at this point, about his authorship, uh, that while they do not directly utter philosophically profound statements, they are not meant in malice, but are presented as a corrective stimulus. In order to explore further the ability of this thesis, uh, we need to consider uh, Kierkegaard's analysis of Socrates, and that uh, is uh, coming up in the concept of irony. The notion of a corrective, uh, we must uh, realize that a corrective is very, in Kierkegaard's view, is very occasional. The same corrective is not uh, called for uh, all the time. And in fact, at one stage uh, in his papers, Kierkegaard says, uh, the next generation will require the opposite corrective. And so uh, Kierkegaard's polemical gadfly uh, criticism ad hominem as it uh, appears to be, uh, he sees as uh, in service of the uh, methods and uh, ways of eliciting truth uh, from an individual. Uh, that uh, were originated by Socrates. Okay, so now let's turn to uh, the concept of irony, uh, called the concept of irony, or on the concept of irony, with constant reference to Socrates. Hong's translated as continual uh, reference uh, to Socrates. Uh, Irony is very, very important throughout all of Kierkegaard's writings. Uh, and to a greater or lesser degree, I think it's always present. And it always uh, alludes back to uh, Socrates and Kierkegaard's uh, emulation, uh, imitation, reduplication of Socrates' uh, approach. Uh, now, the book has, uh, which was Kierkegaard's academic dissertation. Uh, uh, by the way, it was supposed to be written in Latin, uh, but Kierkegaard uh, uh, petitioned to be given special permission uh, to uh, uh, write it in Danish. Uh, and his argument uh, was not that he had trouble with Latin. He was indeed very accomplished at Latin. but. Uh, he believed that the arguments and the subtlety of the language uh, required uh, that he express it in Danish. Uh, that Danish was a language that was, uh, at least in his hands, uh, more poetic. And uh, so the poetic and stylistic elements uh, of the uh, uh, academic work uh, were considered by Kierkegaard important enough to petition uh, that he be allowed to write it in Danish rather than in Latin, and this petition was granted. Although when he did his defense, that was nonetheless conducted in, in Latin. Anyway, the book uh, 
has two main parts. Uh, part one uh, is uh, the, the position of Socrates viewed as irony, uh, and uh, uh, two, then a treatment of the concept of irony as such, and that's uh, the more substantial part of the book, uh, but uh, it may be, uh, uh, I, I think that you would say it's not understandable without uh, fully assimilating uh, Kierkegaard's understanding of Socrates. Uh, normally appended to it these days are his notes of Schelling's lectures in Berlin, uh, and so we see Kierkegaard's ongoing uh, relationship uh, to uh, the uh, German idealist and romanticist uh, movements of his day. Now I've put up here the uh, definition of irony that Kierkegaard uh, gives. Uh, he calls it infinite, absolute negativity. So it's, it's like a destructive force. And so uh, the irony of Socrates, and therefore the adopted, uh, for the same reason, I guess, irony of Kierkegaard is understood by Kierkegaard as this infinitely and absolutely negative force. So let's, let's you know, keep that in mind and, and try to understand it. Now I'm going to continue uh, reading from, from what I have written previously uh, for the sake of of uh, being concise. So about the concept of irony. It is well known that in the spring of 1841, at the time of his stormy sundering of the engagement with Regina Olson, Kierkegaard presented his academic dissertation on the concept of irony with constant reference to Socrates. Regina Olson, uh, was a young woman to whom Kierkegaard was engaged. Uh, the uh, engagement uh, was ended uh, because Kierkegaard believed uh, that his own personality uh, was to, as he put it, melancholy, sad. Or that is to say that there was something destructive about his outlook that would injure the marriage. And so it would be wrong for him to have gone forward with it. Now at the same time that he's in his personal life uh, suggesting that his melancholy uh, would uh, be sufficient reason to terminate his uh, engagement, he is talking about the salutary aspects of irony as infinite absolute negativity. So there's a bit of a, a puzzle here that we should try to uh, figure out. Now, while pursuing the problem of the myutic or midwife like character of Kierkegaard's polemic, the person of Socrates suggests itself as both the theoretical proponent of such a technique, and perhaps more importantly uh, for Kierkegaard, the model par excellence of the individual existentially engaged with the public. Well, this is what I was talking about before, and uh, uh, I'm suggesting here that uh, his understanding of Socrates through and through uh, resonates uh, with this notion. Kierkegaard speaks admiringly of Socrates throughout his authorship, but treats him systematically, uh, that is, tries to explain what he understands about Socrates only uh, in this text, uh, which was his dissertation. Now the dissertation, I would say, stands outside the authorship proper, uh, and uh, it was written under entirely different circumstances to fulfill a formal requirement 
uh, to complete a degree which, uh, as uh, uh, I mentioned previously, uh, he did not any longer at least think he wanted or was valuable to him, and which was uh, uh, the wish of his father for him to complete it. Uh, but now his father uh, has died, uh, and so you know he wouldn't have to do it. So uh, he goes forward with it. Uh, it's it's not uh, part of his authorship as he conceives his authorship. It's not being addressed to. Uh, his reader, my reader, that expression he uses, uh, but rather to the uh, 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 academic committee uh, reviewing it at the university. Uh, by the way, uh, this is a custom that has gone by the by, but in Kierkegaard's day, the defense of dissertations uh, was open to the public. Uh, and it was conducted like a public hearing, uh, almost like a trial. Let's push it a little bit and say almost uh, like the trial of Socrates. Right? Uh, and in this uh, uh, public defense of the dissertation, uh, and one has to write formal theses to defend, um, anyone who comes to it, anyone in attendance could challenge it. Anyone that was uh, permitted to speak up could question it. So the, so the book really is uh, something that was presented to the public. Uh, and like his authorship, uh, presented to the public somewhat polemically. But how it fits into the authorship uh, is uh, still a question. The dissertation stands outside the authorship proper, and so certain questions arise concerning the validity of using it to interpret or clarify later portions of the authorship. And this question has bothered many commentators, but it seems it need not be of issue for two reasons. One, uh, although some have felt that this book is too Hegelian to be authentically Kierkegaard, uh, however, since Kierkegaard had vehemently denied being Hegelian prior to the writing of the concept of irony, uh, already in 1840, a year before this, uh, and since at no time did Kierkegaard disown the book as representing a point of view uh, he had gone beyond or otherwise abandoned, uh, we do, I think, have good reason to try and understand it in a way which is compatible with the subsequent authorship. That's my position anyway. Two, uh, for the topic under consideration, we are most concerned with Kierkegaard's factual understanding of Socrates, and this conception, it is hoped, will become uh, clear uh, that it was not radically changed. Uh, but rather enlarged in his authorship. So the main part of the book that is important, uh, I think, uh, for the later authorship really is uh, part one, uh, the one entitled The Position of Socrates Viewed as Iron. When the dissertation was presented for approval to the University of Copenhagen faculty, although it was unanimously conceded to be of worthy scholarly content, the essay was harshly criticized for containing an excess of sarcasm and mockery, and in fact, being in bad taste. Despite the pointed remarks and requests by several faculty members, uh, Kierkegaard made no alteration to the manuscript. Uh, the book seems to pay a structural allegiance to the Hegelian system, kind of the accepted lingua franca uh, of uh, the University of Copenhagen and, and the uh, theological faculty at the time, and overtly takes up several uh, particularly Hegelian points of view. Uh, but beyond that, it is neither specifically Hegelian nor not anti-Hegelian. 
But throughout the text, one does get the impression that Kierkegaard, at least on some points, is skillfully parodying, you know, satirizing, making fun of uh, the presentation of Hegel. Uh, large portions of the text are highly ambiguous, and one feels that Kierkegaard deliberately has made them so. This tendency is exhibited especially in the closing chapters of the book. Throughout the text, one frequently finds examples of irony and humor and mockery and deceit, hardly uh, qualities that would be typical in an academic dissertation, to say the least. Yet, as a whole, the book is presented as a straightforward analysis of a concept, and for the most part, I think that's just what it is. Within his academic dissertation, Kierkegaard develops the notion of Socrates, that is, the Socrates possessed by his daemon. Uh, his daemon was like the uh, inner spiritual voice uh, that uh, Socrates had. And for Kierkegaard, this is uh, utterly important. Uh, but, but the daemon, or the daemon, uh, is the inner spiritual voice that Socrates himself refers to, and Kierkegaard is developing that uh, as irony. Uh, and does this in contrast to and in critique of the notion of Socrates conceived as a mere practitioner of irony. All right, so the idea of the infinite, absolute negativity and sort of the way in which that uh, could overtake uh, an individual uh, is pertinent to think about here. Were Socrates only a practitioner of irony, Kierkegaard argues, his diamond would be false. Socrates' diamond is the determination which fully accounts for his relation to the state and to the public. His relation to his own daimon is determined by those inward structures, or those dynamic inward structures, of the relation of individual to oracle, uh, and namely, the word for that, at least as far as Kierkegaard goes, is piety. Thus Socrates, as can be seen by his irony, presents an example of the pious man's relation to the public. Kierkegaard contends in his portrayal that Socrates' entire life was, as regards practical concerns, uh, political, ethical, and so on, uh, one of indirection, simply because he, as Socrates himself proclaimed, did not know anything. Socrates could not appropriate the good, the beautiful, or the realm of the eternal forms, sort of the highest kind of knowledge according to Plato. Socrates could not appropriate these uh, for the reason that he did not know them. Kierkegaard argues that Socrates had conceived infinity in the form of ignorance and that he must have had this conception with him everywhere. For Kierkegaard, ignorance was not merely a technique assumed by Socrates, nor could it be if he conceived the infinite in this way. Socrates is most well known for his technique of asking questions, ostensibly to bring his partner in discussion to the realization of an underlying philosophical principle. In his analysis of this, Kierkegaard maintains that the purpose of asking questions may be either speculative or ironic. If, if it is speculative, one asks a question in order to get an answer that contains what the questioner is looking for. It follows that a skillful questioner with this purpose, by asking successive questions, could draw out from the respondent a deep and meaningful answer. So let's say I know that you know uh, something 
uh, very important. Uh, I have a vague idea of what that is. I want to learn it from you, and I do so uh, through the technique of asking questions in which I try to develop a kind of correspondence uh, between uh, what you know on the topic and what I know, and in that way enlarge or expand my own understanding. I'm speculating that you know more about it than I do, and that uh, you can teach me and I will uh, learn it. Now, to be sure, uh, when Socrates is interacting with uh, uh, people in the marketplace, uh, he presents himself as though that's what he's doing. But Kierkegaard says that's not what he's doing at all. Kierkegaard says his purpose is not speculative, uh, but ironic. The other possibility, according to Kierkegaard, is to ask a question with no intention of obtaining a satisfactory answer, but rather to use the question to remove apparent content and thereby leave the respondent with nothing. Okay, so this is the infinite absolute negativity of irony. The first of the alternatives obviously presupposes that there is content to be drawn out in the second that there is not. Kierkegaard maintained that because Socrates was so pervaded by irony, his questions were not intended to discover or draw out any information, but rather to undermine and even destroy the position being questioned. Now, I think what this means is that Socrates, uh, according to Kierkegaard, suspects, maybe very strongly suspects, uh, that his interlocutor, his partner in conversation, uh, who is supposedly uh, an authority on something or other, uh, that, that that person's so-called knowledge is really not that, and uh, that uh, uh, he needs to be shown this would be beneficial to him, this would be salutary, this would be helpful. Uh, that the knowledge he thinks he possesses uh, is bogus, is uh, ill-structured, is uh, somehow inadequate. And in this way, what Socrates is doing with this kind of destructive, ironic mode of questioning is not meaning to destroy the individual, but to destroy that kind of false knowledge uh, which is uh, uh, overcoming uh, his ability to uh, gain a genuine understanding. So this is philosophy by indirection. Uh, as we have noted, philosophy is the love of wisdom, uh, and here one might say that what Socrates is aiming at is the replacement of pseudo-knowledge, false knowledge, uh, with wisdom. Now, Kierkegaard specifically states about these two methods. Now, it was the latter method which was especially practiced by Socrates. In other words, Socrates was a negative force undermining the accepted beliefs and myths, including significantly traditional beliefs in the gods and in the state. Kierkegaard will bring this forward into his own context where the, the, the received uh, doctrines of the Church of Denmark are under a kind of siege by him. The explanation as to why Socratic questioning was of the second type and the standpoint that of negative undermining, according to Kierkegaard, is found in Socrates' description of himself as theoretically ignorant. Kierkegaard emphasized that Socrates proclaimed himself theoretically ignorant and not ignorant in an empirical sense. His ignorance was his philosophical standpoint and was thoroughly negative. That is, Kierkegaard says, uh, Socrates was ignorant of any reason, that is, any reasonable explanation underlying things, such as, for example, an eternal or divine principle. However, according to Kierkegaard, to stipulate as your philosophical standpoint your ignorance about such things is, uh, paradoxically, to assert a knowledge 
of the reality of such entities. Here's how Kierkegaard puts it. Uh, quoting Kierkegaard, he knew that it was, but he did not know what it was. He was conscious of it, since the only thing he could predicate of it was that he knew nothing about it, unquote. But this knowledge, which might be called ironic knowledge, does not admit of any objective determination. Therefore, Socrates does not, for example, objectively know the specific deities. Kierkegaard argues that Socrates' surprise at being found guilty uh, in his trial, uh, as uh, presented in Plato's Apology, uh, his surprise at being found guilty by such a small number of votes is a clear indication that he does not recognize in the state anything objective which could validly stand in opposition to a particular subject. So we see a hint of anarchism here in this theme of Socrates as a kind of anarchist uh, we'll try to pursue as we go forward. Socrates, according to Kierkegaard, did not see anything qualitatively different about the fact that it was an official state decision and not simply the opinions of various individuals. Kierkegaard adds that in a sense, the state does not even or did not even exist for Socrates. The reason the irony of Socrates see, causes, his, uh, causes him to reject every objective determination is that irony is the standpoint of the existing individual turned inward to seek the higher truth of subjectivity. Oh, underscore this phrase, the higher truth of subjectivity. The objective determination which he, the, the, detect, the objective determinations which are rejected, uh, Kierkegaard seems to suggest, are arbitrary values which arise from convention or tradition. Socrates, as a genuine ironist, has recognized the complete relativity of such negative determ of such objective determinations, excuse me, of such objective determinations, and thus is at a higher level of existence. In irony, the individual does not directly issue a polemic against the arbitrary con conventions of most people. That, it is, that is, he does not become involved in politics, but rather dissimulates his superiority, his wisdom, and seeks a higher absolute value. In searching the realm of objective determination, he finds nothing of such value. He seeks this value, but Kierkegaard maintains he knows nothing of it. Socrates' only knowledge is his ignorance, that is, his knowledge of nothing. Very, very problematic notion here and one I hope that we can uh, uh, discuss uh, uh, thoughtfully as uh, we go forward. Uh, Kierkegaard says, uh, to know that one is ignorant is the beginning of wisdom. But if one knows no more than this, it is only a beginning. It is this knowledge which holds Socrates ironically aloft. Yet Kierkegaard has proposed that Socrates uh, presents a negative force actively undermining established myth and tradition. The above would seem to attribute a positive knowledge to Socrates and to contradict the thesis that he is ironically aloft. To answer this problem, Kierkegaard offers this description of irony. Quote, again, a quote from Kierkegaard. The difficulty here encountered is essentially that irony in a strict sense can never set forth a thesis because irony is a determination of the being for himself 
the being for himself subject who, with perpetual agility, allows nothing to endure, and because of this agility, is unable to consolidate himself in the total view that he causes nothingness to exist. In the last analysis, the ironist must always posit something, but what he posits in this way is nothingness. Now it is impossible to take nothingness seriously without either arriving at something. This happens when one takes it speculatively seriously or without despairing. This happens when one takes it personally seriously. But the ironist does neither of these, and to this extent, one may say he is not really serious about it. Irony is the seriousness with nothingness insofar as it is not the seriousness with something. This is, this is really interesting, I think, really hard to completely unpack. Uh, but uh, what Kierkegaard is doing here is uh, tying together a kind of ontology uh, with a level of political polemics and personal psychology. This passage is full of ambiguities which can be interpreted adequately only when Kierkegaard's development of irony as a, a broader sphere, as a border sphere, that is state of existence, which is the border between the aesthetic and the ethical sphere, is taken into full account. And this is something that uh, when we're discussing the stages on life's way, uh, I will try to develop. Uh, the idea, as I understand it with Kierkegaard, is that in the dialectic of existence, which moves one from the aesthetic stage of life to the ethical, has as its kind of transitional catalyst irony. And then in the transition between the sphere of the ethical to the higher sphere of the religious, uh, there uh, is a border state uh, which again is the catalyst of transition, uh, which is in fact for Kierkegaard humor. So irony and humor, which are uh, kind of uh, destructive, uh, or at least uh, breaking down attitudes, are essential for the advancement of subjective uh, understanding and wisdom. In uh, his uh, text called Concluding Unscientific Postscript, uh, we see this uh, idea of the border spheres. At this point, uh, let's focus on Kierkegaard's assertion uh, that it fits as a description of Socrates' ignorance. That is, it is Socrates' special form of ignorance which accounts for his irony, and it is his irony which explains his destructive power. The importance of the relation of irony to ethical action must not be underestimated. The transition from one existence sphere to another in Kierkegaard's scheme is a sharp breach in the continuity of an existing individual's life. No one can live in two spheres at the same time. One cannot be both aesthetic and ethical, or ethical and religious. That sounds peculiar, but as we understand better what these spheres of existence, or the stages on life's way are, I think it will become clear. If the individual is making the transition from the aesthetic to the ethical view, the aesthetic value is completely overturned. It is not that the individual loses all aesthetic inclination, but rather that it comes under the domination of the ethical. 
It is a transvaluation of values, not unlike Nietzsche's, uh, although uh, of a rather more limited scope. Because of the radical shift in values, the transition from one sphere to another is always one of personal crisis. Personal crisis, psychological crisis. The crisis is generated by a subjective decision for which there is no objective determination which could serve as an adequate guide. Such crises with their accompanying anxieties are the outward signs of growth in Kierkegaard's existing individual and are not experienced by the practitioners of the lower forms of the comic in the aesthetic sphere. The lower forms of the comic, uh, we'll talk about that uh, again when we're talking about the stages on life's way. In this connection, it's important to realize that Kierkegaard presents this transition and upward growth as being in no way necessary, but only as contingent possibility, as accidental possibility. The crisis of transition is self-inflicted as a consequence of a purely subjective decision. The crisis is founded on the radical contradiction between the values of the aesthetic and the ethical spheres. Such objectively unresolvable uh, crises, according to Kierkegaard, will manifest itself in either the comic or the tragic. It becomes comic following the Aristotelian distinction if there is no way for the individual to avoid suffering. I'm sorry, if there is a way for the individual to avoid suffering. Uh, thus, the border sphere of genuine irony is the comic form to alleviate the pain of the transitional crisis inherent in the change from the aesthetic to the ethical. So Socrates, we noted, called himself a midwife, and we observed that one of the uh, abilities of the midwife was to minimize the pain in the delivery process. Well, moving this into the Kierkegaardian uh, context, uh, then uh, the uh, role of the ironist, which Socrates exemplifies better than anyone, uh, is to, you know, not necessarily, but uh, when a subjective decision is made uh, by the individual uh, to, uh, through uh, the ironic uh, choice of discussion, dialogue, uh, actually uh, keep it from being a tragic decision and one that uh, one can consider with some levity. All right, so where have we gotten today? Uh, a few big points, all of which uh, uh, point to many, many other points, and all of which uh, deserve a lot of discussion. Uh, we're just at the beginning, so uh, we will have that discussion. Uh, first is that the complexity uh, of the pseudonymous authorship reflects his fraught relationship with the public. Uh, of course, the pseudonymous authorship allows for uh, a kind of created conversation among uh, a multiplicity of points of view. That's correct. Uh, but it also, uh, and we saw this in the, uh, from the papers of One Still Living, uh, is an aspect of the uh, necessity of a polemical intervention uh, into uh, public life. Two, we've seen that there are a couple of targets going on here. Uh, 
uh, Kierkegaard uh, is not simply against local politics or local decisions. He's against uh, the overriding uh, sort of worldview or the overriding life and worldview that he thinks is pervasive in the public realm uh, that uh, emanates from the values inherent in German Romanticism and German idealism. And it's manifest in Copenhagen, and it's manifest in Kierkegaard's uh, standing in Copenhagen within the theological community, because the theological community had pretty much uh, adapted a kind of Hegelian uh, approach to religion. And so these are the targets. These are the targets, and uh, the nobility of this kind of attack uh, is uh, being proclaimed by Kierkegaard uh, through the uh, agency of Socratic method. Then thirdly, uh, in our takeaway, uh, we have to realize that there are a lot of you know, concepts that are very important to Kierkegaard that at this point are only uh, in their early stages of development. Uh, we see nascent ideas of commitment, of point of view, and uh, subjectivity, uh, and the existing individual. Now, these are being put on the table. These become the main uh, topics uh, for Kierkegaard's entire authorship. Well, that's enough for today. Uh, and uh, we'll. Uh, uh, for those of you in the uh, class, we'll discuss uh, this uh, carefully uh, in our in our face-to-face -face, uh, meetings. Uh, so, uh, goodbye for now.